Hi, welcome to Blaze Hackman Masterclass number one. I'm Blaze Hackman and Masterclass number one and all these masterclasses are just about my personal opinion on uh, things to do with film and theater and uh, creatively online, all that kind of stuff. So I hope you enjoy it. A um, little bit about myself. I've had a lot of experience in the media um, as an actor, as a voiceover. I've written quite a few scripts and projects over the years. And over that time, I've just formed my own opinion of how things should be done. And so you can either listen to this or you cannot. It's up to you. Um, I think one of the enduring concepts that uh, I adhere to creatively is what David Lynch says. He says, just do it till it's correct. Okay, and that's pretty subjective as to what is correct. So you might find that uh, your grandma thinks it's correct or your friends do or a multinational worldwide audience thinks that what you're doing is correct. Um, that's entirely up to you. Depends on your other goals as well. What do you want to do? Do you want to make a lot of money or do you just uh, have a hobby? Or do you need neither and it's just some kind of weird personal satisfaction? You stick it in the bottom of the drawer, whatever you're creating. So um, I think that whatever you think is correct is right. And as a result, I've kind of steered away from a lot of the formulas I see in um, creating stuff. And I see myself primarily as a creator. I used to say actor for years and years, but I think I'm more than an actor. I think I like to create stuff. And I think that um, the perfect film for me is Alien. If you go and read Sid Field's Guide to Screenwriting, he'll tell you the perfect film is uh, Chinatown. Is it Sid Field? I get Sid Field and Sid Mead mixed up. Um, but, you know, or some people say, well, you've got to have Act 1, Act 2, and then 3, and in Act 3, uh, there's the resolution, the Aristotelian ending, which I learned at university when I was doing a Bachelor of Arts in Performance um, some years ago. And then you've got other plays like Wojciech, which is, you know, a play I studied at, at that uni. Not, not extensively, but I like the idea of, well, you get this play, you can have 12 chapters, you can just chuck it up into the air, and then the chapters fall on the ground, and then you just put the deck back together, and that's the story. So there is no kind of like, um, you know, this linear narrative that has to have a resolution at the end, which is kind of like every Hollywood film. Or oh, there is no script um, perfection. Um, if you read David Mamet's plays and the way he does dialogue, which is kind of amazing. And then I think it was a film called The Heist. And um, was it, oh, I can't remember who was in it, but a couple of actors were actually doing his dialogue on camera. And I thought, wow, this is rubbish. This script is really try hard. It's not, and then I realized it was David Mamet. So what worked in theater didn't necessarily work in, uh, you know, on film. But it certainly did in Glenn, Gary Glenn Ross. So, you know, it's pretty subjective. It's, it's just up to you. Uh, and I think sometimes, even if you're shit, <laughs> what you're doing, you're kind of on the right path. So if someone comes in and tries to make it better and doesn't make it all shiny, then they're actually in a way compromising you. You know, uh, that's why I like, and I think the future of uh, entertainment and creation is uh, platforms like YouTube. And if you look at PewDiePie, I mean, there is it's just a mess what he does, but it kind of works because there's no correct, just spits it out stream of consciousness um and there is an audience you know so many subscribers find something in that and people who don't realize that are kind of well they're going to get left behind but that's my opinion i'm rambling now so i've got this project it's called painted state and uh i've been working on it for about five or six years oh I, look i won't go into it too much now because there's plenty of time for that in the future but for me as someone who's um well i'm 50 now right and I, so when I was a kid in the 1970s I knew I wanted to be an actor I saw the Poseidon Adventure I saw Gene Hackman hanging off uh, he was in the engine room of this upturned boat and he was screaming at God and cursing God he was at the same time burning his hands because he was hanging off this valve wheel and then he opened the valve wheel and then he falls into this huge conflagration and oily death and everyone else gets saved. But I just thought that was the most incredible scene. And so um, Blaze Hackman is kind of like a stage name or identity. Still quite ill-defined at this stage, but um, I, I kind of ripped off Gene Hackman's surname to create half of this Blaze Hackman persona. And so 
films like that have been highly influential. And so I think Alien, to me, became the perfect film. It was for a while it was Blade Runner, but I think that the simplicity of Ridley Scott's Alien, um, if I was to say that uh, it's a amazing, predicted, hellish future that could happen um, and in the, in the most interesting way because it's backed by science. Um, and you've got what should be a B-movie on a budget where Ridley Scott, the pressure of no budget, actually it creates more invention and more ideas. And so he just did an incredible job with that. Um, and you have uh, Ian Holm, uh, John Hur, uh, Sigourney Weaver, Tom Skerritt. These great, amazing, classically trained actors. And they're really bringing a script to life uh, and this simple story. And, of course, H.R. Giger and his monster and the visual futurists of guys like Ron Cobb um, Sid Mead, uh, a little bit of Chris Foss maybe in there as well. So all these elements came together. And to me, that's the kind of thing I'm interested in. And uh, film is not so much as it, entertainment as it is almost like a prediction of a future as well. You know, so any kind of story, you have to just sit down at a campfire and be able to tell someone a story and engage them and say hey what did you think about this and stare into the flames and they, they fires their imagination that's all you really need you don't need some funding body with a glossy picture of some well known actor on it to make it right or some guy to make sure your plot points you know perfect at this particular point um, seriously fuck that shit just go and make stuff and if you're happy with it and, and you find an audience then awesome you know you can't go to a Norwegian black metal band and tell them well that's not right or that's not correct they just do whatever they want they create stuff and either you find yourself in a room by yourself because everyone thinks it's repulsive or you don't so um, I'm just keep harping on this point about making things correct in your own mind I'll make one more point about that you, look there's a point where previous to that well you do have to acquire knowledge and you might be uh, you know a pretty young person or you're in your teens or whatever you, but there's a, you know there's a point where you're you're making sculpture uh, you're an artist of some sort and you have to let go of the handrail and you have to trust yourself and not everyone's going to like um, surrealism by Salvador Dali they're not going to like Henry Moore sculptures they're not going to like your version of a sculpture some people are going to go well that's rubbish I can't you know understand that but that's you so uh, you get good at doing whatever that is so you do have to receive information at some point along the way um, but at a point that tapers off and you just have to trust yourself and form your own style anyway so here's this thing called painted state um, and alien was highly influential for me in it I wrote a bunch of ideas down about five six years ago because I'd been working as an actor for a long time and I was kind of frustrated very frustrated because I thought well my destiny is to become this you know fat dad um, not that I'm fat I'm um, actually sort of pride myself in being pretty fit through Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, and surfing and other sports like that but in the industry I, I think in Australia particularly which is where I live in Sydney never have really been embraced and um as an actor on the level that I wanted to I'm always playing the bad guy that you know the, the bad cop um I'm always to me uh my mind the band-aid um a mechanism for to prop up the other actors to do interesting things and um I personally think that this saying that there's no small parts there's no small actors that's rubbish as well complete rubbish because you might do that early in your career but as you progress you, you want to have a bigger role you want to be the central character and I think a lot of great actors are great because they get to do their craft so often and because it's such a tough industry a lot of people don't get that opportunity so there's this greatness is locked away and then it's replaced by um, depression and inactivity and ultimately they leave the industry so uh, I just thought well I don't really want to go down that path so I just wrote the perfect vehicle for myself and a story that I thought would be really entertaining and I'd written a bunch of scenarios but this is the one I liked the most so before you look at it um, just know that I started this before I haven't even seen Mad Max Fury Road on purpose yet that's been out for a while, year and a half now um, uh, I've been toying with the idea of clowns for um, or clowning not that this is a clown film if it is it's clowns with a K for potassium because potassium iodide protects you your thyroid from radiation more about that later but uh, I like the idea of uh, putting on uh, makeup and a facade and where that's going to lead you as a 
and what the permission it gives you as an individual, as an actor. So I and uh, I kind of this is a mask of a bleak future, and so this is a really interesting story that I made, and this this predates obviously all this irresponsible, although kind of enticing in the early phases this evil clown scenarios you know that's a one-dimensional interpretation whereas this is more of a prediction of a future um, where there's a, a nuclear holocaust survivors find this stuff in a military bunker it's paint they put it on their face protection um, but they don't realize it's actually a weapon so i've cut a bunch of scenes we shot a whole bunch of scenes in uh, Sydney and, and Broken Hill, where they shot the original Mad Max. Um, and I did that about a year and a half ago. And slowly I've been looking around, trying to sell this, did a bit of an Indiegogo, that didn't take off. Um, so then I decided to deliver my thoughts through these masterclasses and then also deliver the scenes. And then in between the scenes we haven't shot, well, I do those in a, as an audio book in an American accent. So I was just going to get around to doing that. But I'm going to try and deliver these scenes uh, chronologically. You can go on the Painted State YouTube or the Blaze Hackman YouTube and look at those scenes, uh, you know, probably at a bit of frame rate than where I'm going to deliver them now. But I'm just going to play it to you now and then I can come back and tell you all about it. So, And then what I'm going to do in each of these classes is just ramble like this about my thoughts about creating stuff um, and I'm also going to go through each uh, cut and say, well, this is why I did this and why did I do that and what was I thinking there and what could be better and what, what's worse. So I hope you enjoy it. So yeah, look, I am rambling. Get used to it. This is the opening scene. I'll be back in a second. You have a look at this. And there we go. Okay, that's the next scene. We'll just pause that one. Um, oh, amazing Mac shortcuts. So, there you have it. That's the opening scene of Painted State. Well, it's probably scene three, so you get a couple of shots, uh, sun rising over a apocalyptic desert landscape, and then we go inside and start seeing shadows, and this guy gets up. Um, and then he puts on the makeup, and uh, I, I put the details from the screenplay at the beginning of each scene and I've kind of been doing that on a regular basis because with the other scenes as well. I think it sets the scene so that people um, are no doubt as to what's happening in case my editing's a bit rubbish. <laughs> because it, that's the, sometimes you need to uh, take these opinions. Uh, I just said beforehand there, you know, it doesn't really matter. But it, well, well, it does when you are open to it because you, you are unsure. When you are sure, then you proceed. But if you think, well, I hope this is clear, 
go and consult someone you trust and ask them, uh, does this cut work? And then put yourself an insurance policy in there by putting the scene details in, which is part of this process. Um, you know, I wouldn't always do that. Some people think that if you put any kind of narration in a film, the film's in trouble because you're kind of having to explain to the audience. But in Blade Runner, I thought uh, Harrison Ford's monologues were awesome. You know, it really helped the film and he's got an amazing voice. So let's talk about this clown thing, right? This is an idea, and it's not even uniquely my idea, but it's something I've played with for a long time uh, theatrically. And I guess I was talking to my kids last night about this when we were watching uh, the video clip of Starman, David Bowie, the late but amazing David Bowie. Huge influence on me. The alter ego of Ziggy Stardust that he was running his sense of creativity, the weirdness that he was coming up with, which shouldn't have succeeded, um, but somehow people found it appealing. And I really enjoy the permission of uh, dressing up and just looking weird and doing kind of weird stuff. And so I've done this for a long time. And it kind of, I started with this desire of Bowie. And then uh, when I was first acting... Um, I got a job. I'm trying to find the image here. So I got this job on a play called Two Gentlemen of Verona. And this is around about 1996. This is before I'd actually trained in theatre. And I was uh, dropping into the actor Centre at Surrey Hills uh, in the old church there, doing Dean Carey's classes, just dropping classes, had this desire and... Uh, there's a place called Regeneration Culture and they were just a, like this bunch of crazy, hippie, minimalist livers all in this warehouse and they were going to put on this play and all the stuff, you know, you can see this robot was made of recycled material and it was post-apocalypse and they had Proteus and Valentine, the two leads. I was Proteus uh, looking a little bit kind of Frank and there, <laughs> but... Uh, it was a lot of fun, all the makeup, you know, we did it every night. I, the, the building, there was a cavity in the wall structure and um, I used to sleep in there, like in the wall, uh, in a room, this guy decked out with foam on occasion. So it was uh, an amazing play, intimidating too, because of my first Shakespeare, lots and lots of dialogue, didn't always get through it successfully. And the uh, delivery and interpretation, I was just saying the words and trying to sound like I knew what I was doing, but I really wasn't trained um, there's a great Shakespeare coach uh, and director, Australian guy called Arnie Nemi. Tough guy. I did Julius Caesar, sorry, um, Antony and Cleopatra and played Mark Antony uh, with him in the 2000s. Uh, and that play nearly broke me uh, at uni in second year. And it's the second most wordy play of Shakespeare's uh, next to Hamlet. And even, uh, what's his name? Silence of the Lambs. God, why is his name escaping me right now? Anthony Hopkins. Even he said Antony and Cleopatra nearly broke him as well. He just couldn't get the lines down. So this predates that, but the point is that here was this, you know, the th it was kind of like permission to hide behind this mask and be something else uh, and maybe use that as an excuse if, if I didn't feel that confident to have this uh, character. So that, that was uh, Proteus and... Two Gentlemen of Verona, and then we had, just gonna get our um, chronology right here. So then, another mate of mine, Craig Anderson, he did this uh, amazing version of Othello, Clown Prince of Venice, and then I was playing Brabantio and a couple other characters in that, and they um, were hamming it up there in the background, and this is Megan Drury, great female actor who was uh, in the play with me. So there's a shot backstage. Once again, more permission. And the, the thing that Craig did really well in that play was he, he played the tragedy and comedy of Othello. They say that this, it's like a pendulum that swings between tragedy and comedy. Um, and so Craig Anderson and another guy, Brian Moses, who helped me out with Painted the State, they just re really talented technicians, uh, much more talented than me in the art of making that kind of show and um, great storytellers 
and I really enjoyed the permission of being that show. And then, so I kind of took a bit of that into this band. So my friends and I, we'd had this um, joke band, sort of like a drunken band called the Vibro Cage Extremists. And we just put crazy makeup on and then we dress up in these jumpsuits and this is a, a mate's studio in Frankston in Victoria. And this is actually 10 years ago um, and shot on uh, a Sony Z1, which back then was amazing resolution because it could shoot 7, 720p. Wow. And this is a screen grab from that. We just honestly uh, got drunk, put this makeup on and over the years, we've actually knocked out quite a few video clips. But once again, this character here is called the Jaw. Um, and uh, the thing about the Viro Cage Extremist was we weren't even beholden to a script. We'd make a song up in the afternoon and we just, we couldn't even play the instruments really. We'd just leap around making this crazy stream of consciousness music. And then a more recent photo. I think over the years, our. Um, just open this up. Over the years, our that was shot on a 5D, which a lot of pain in the state was. Half of it was shot on the test footage, and so you know, it, we kind of started perfecting this look and this madness of um, the jaw and the other characters. And if you go on YouTube and just dial in "Vibro Cage Extremist" on YouTube and look at some of our videos, um, you can see that it's pretty experimental. Uh, we just we just make music. We just make this weird music, and that's an interesting process because uh, my, my my mate and I, Stuart, we, he's got kind of we're very different in the kind of thing we want to make. So it's, it takes a lot of negotiation, but eventually we get there, and one, it's pretty satisfying when you get it done. And then, so you've seen that one. Then finally, kind of this is a shot from um, Painted State. And this is where it's ended up. And this, I love, I love this shot. I'll tell you why I love this shot, which we'll hear more about in the future. If I can only open it up, can we just make this larger? That's real blood. Um, the day we were shooting, I did a stunt, which I didn't want one of the um, female actors to do. And I just, a lot of the time with the script to make the test footage, I'd have to switch characters around or I'd have to rewrite it in a minor fashion so that we could make sense of the scene and use whoever was available uh, but the, this was a case of staying safe anyway the bottom line is and I do have this on video too I'm too scared to release it because I don't want it to go viral for the wrong reasons but it's it's me leaping through a wall of inflatable sex dolls and the rack the dolls were attached to smashed me in the face and then put a huge cut between my eyes then I had to go into the next scene so we shot the scene and uh I was actually very stoked with it because the scene came up great and the blood just looked amazing. It was the perfect kind of thing. So, uh, <laughs> don't tell anyone. Um, I don't want anyone coming to me and saying, well, we can't insure you because you're just too dangerous to make a movie with, it. which is the destination for this. In fact, it's not even, this Painted State started out as a film. Uh, and this is the character X, my character, the lead character in Painted State. Um, it started out as a film, as a feature film, but then, you know, this is realization of this golden age of uh, television and subscriber based television. Um, is that the, if you get six seasons, you get to really build that character. Look at, look at Rick on Walking Dead or, or Game of Thrones. You really get to engage with the character and you, you, you want to see them again and they get to tell the story and the actors get to act and they get profiled and now a lot of these um, not that you know I want to be a huge Hollywood star I just want to do work like this which I think is so much fun and interesting and you just love going to work and you're passionate about um, to be able to do more of this kind of stuff at a higher level have someone go yeah wow I mean pretty much and I believe it will you know I'm a late bloomer but it will happen one day is that people will see this and go wow or well, the worst case scenario is when I drop dead one day that my sons will they'll find it you know, buried in a filing cabinet and then start editing it and, and um, exposing it to people and then you know, they might get a, a benefit out of it. So, um, so that's sort of like half, 20 minutes into the film. So if we go back and we look at this dude again, um, where 
is the shot. Okay. So um, I'm just going to mute, kind of mute the sound on this, or not entirely, but I'll, because the sound is actually very significant. So just just look at it by frame by frame. You know, uh, seven twenty. We're going to go to ten eight eighty resolution. Someone the other day. This is where we are technologically. Someone was complaining about. Oh, who wants to watch anything in seven twenty p? Some twenty something uh, YouTuber. But I think data rates now and delivery especially in the US uh, so fast now that people are expecting 1080 for in, in, in to, we're into 4k now so the the people so anything you look at it five years ago looks like it was shot with a potato and now people are getting fussy about 720p so uh, I don't know what the encoding will be like when I export from screenflow fantastic desktop Mac capture program by the way but well, here we are at 10 ADP. So, um, if we look at the opening here of this scene one, this will be delivered by Sage or perhaps myself in a US accent. In the beginning came the war. To survive the war, we put on the paint. But the paint did something to us. And so, a new war began. There's my uh, US accent. Not really warmed up. I do work professionally as a voiceover, by the way, and I do have to be somewhere in probably about half an hour. So I'll try and get through much of this as I can. Um, and I have worked on a few US projects and did work on a show called Hunters last year, which didn't really get critical acclaim or early this year as well, uh, but did get to meet Gail Ann Hurd, albeit briefly, and got to work with some of the directors of The Walking Dead. So. Um, that's where I'm really headed with this. I'm, I'm thinking big with this. And this uh, four lines really sums up, uh, this is the pitch. So, you know, I used to say, oh, Mad Max with clowns, but I don't like referring to the Mad Max and I don't like people thinking of clowns with a, with a C because then, you know, you into Ronald McDonald or now it's kind of been sullied by these, a lot of these irresponsible um, people who are doing scary clown phenomenon. So it's more about the paint and what lies beneath this film. It's more of a psychological thriller. Um, I could link back to the Indiegogo campaign we had, which is kind of goes through that in detail. But it's the psychology that I'm interested in, uh, about how humans behave without the rule of law, about how humans uh, behave in an alien environment. And I think people that capture that kind of hysteria... Um, quite well would be someone like Peter Weir um, or, or quite if you don't want to go mad you look at David Lynch any of those guys that's the hysteria that they can really capture and there's a great film called um, Picnic at Hanging Rock an Australian film um, and another great film to capture that especially in Australia and it, one of the motivating reasons why we went and shot at Broken Hill was not Mad Max it was actually another film called Wake in Fright and um, directed by the guy that actually directed uh, a Rambo with Stallone and he was a Canadian guy called Ted Kotcheff and it's just an amazing film Wake and Fright uh, there's there's a shot in that of and which was shot not far from here actually in Sydney but it's meant to be um, shot in the country but it's like this room full of hundreds of men and they're all drinking and then someone opens this freezer up for, uh, they're icing the um, the beer bot the the beer glasses and you can just smell you can smell the stale beer and the, the chill coming off the glasses and the kind of masculinity flowing and there's all these guys that are sort of assembled and this uh, whole film revolves around this bit drinking culture and the guy who plays the central figure uh, is a teacher and he's trying to escape this but he can't fate just deals him and he deals himself some, some pretty bad hands literally through gambling so he gets stuck in this uh, this land, and and someone, you know, I read an article recently on that film. It said it was, it's about an introvert trapped in a land of extroverts, and I think that that is what's happening with Painted State. This guy's an introvert, and he's trapped in a land full of extroverts, and a lot of that is created uh, by the paint. This paint, which is a weapon, which comes with powers, which protects you from radiation. Uh, the downside is that there's a cost to it. It does drive you mad 
it does make you more paranoid. It does uh, take parts of your personality and exaggerate them. So that's where the war is. It's an internal and external war. It's also a gender war. We'll get into that. So I had these four lines, had to make a big font, nice and clear. And then, uh, you know, you get these generic um, plugins, um, Premiere Pro, which I cut on, which I love. I use that and Final Cut Pro 10. Um, but mainly Premiere Pro for the big stuff. And then if I need to get a particular grade or certain things I can't do, or don't know my way around in Premiere Pro, I'll go back to Final Cut Pro. So I put, just put some bubble and squeak in this. So I put a bit of um, shutter roll and displacement and a bit of graininess. But you, you, you know, people always do that and they always seem to like, oh, let's make something look like an old time thing. So they put in some sepia font. And uh, I don't like, sorry, not sepia font, sepia tint. And you <laughs> like that look. Like, oh, it's ye old times. Let's put in sepia tint. So just sepia, just blanket sepia. Really don't like that look. But um, I think the font here could be the same font that was used in the opening sequence of Blade Runner where they had um, the whole information about replicants. Go and look at Blade Runner. It's exactly the same font that I used. Um, and that's a brief overview of what's about to happen of the world we're going to enter. So let's keep going. Some of the bubble and squeak, you can see it moving. It looks all right. Um, okay. So now we're into, is it Korean New, the font for the scripts? There's, I think there's Korean New, Korean Bold. I can't remember. One of the things I've... Uh, I use Celtics. It's like free online software. When I started, it was freer to write the script. Uh, so if you are considering script writing, use Celtics. You can use Final Draft 6. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it's probably later. that's what I had as an option as well. But I started on Celtics, and Final Draft is quite expensive, but Celtics was free at the time. There's a few, uh, you know, and then, then sometimes... If you're making this stuff, you know, oh, let's get the cards out. And I did a script in the past and I had a card system and I'd stick the cards on the wall, index cards. And <laughs> the script was called Xenocide, X-E-N-O-C-I-D-E. And I was living, this is 20 years ago, and I wrote it uh, while I was living in DY, Northern Beaches of Sydney. And my whole cruddy apartment just had a whole wall of these index cards. But just it just wasn't another level of frustration. Um, and uh, it was a good script. And then Matthew Riley, who was a law student, who then um, was kind of discovered by a friend of mine who worked for Angus and Robertson Publishers and helped him self-publish or picked up his self-published book. She, uh, she yeah, so she helped launch him. That could be a complete, that's a memory, that story. So if, uh, hopefully it's 100% accurate. But he pretty much wanted a Korean writing because he wanted a job where he didn't have to get up earlier than 11 o'clock in the morning and I thought that was a legendary statement of um, ambition um, so how do we get on to Matthew Rowley yes he wrote a book called Museum and it is exactly the same scenario uh, as my scenario and there's a couple of museum horror films but pretty much in Xenocide um, you know uh, there's a truck full of medical waste or something and then uh, some dude falls into it it's radioactive and then he crawls up a tunnel ends up in the museum and then starts terrorising like a cute few people in the museum who's doing an overnight shift so uh, you know there's a kind of same with Alien 2 um, when you've got a few characters I, I think it's a better film when you start populating with too many characters there are a few scenes in my film where there are lots of characters but it's, it kind of dilutes the drama that's why I never thought the second and third Matrix films worked because the, you know, it, in the beginning, it was Keanu Reeves and Hugo Weaving essentially fighting each other uh, in the Matrix, and there's a simplicity to, to that. In Alien, there's like six characters fighting this alien. In Xenocide, it was like three or four people in a museum fighting this alien, and, and then you've got X who's got a few gangs and there's a few uh, scenes but there's a simplicity of him versus other people versus the paint so 
um, keep it simple, stupid, is, especially when you're starting out, is my my tip. Don't try and overcomplicate stuff. Um, so let's get back to this. We faded in, and we've got a desert day, sun rising over a post-apocalyptic desert. Somber light bleeds through the windows, heavily taped with piss-coloured plastic sheets. I think the original script had, had lead on them as well, uh, because there had to be an explanation how you're stopping the radiation. And so yeah, you'll notice in this character, not only does he use timing, he's got a limited amount of time to get his um, old makeup on off and then the new makeup on. Not only that, um, you go, well, how do you explain he's in this room? There's no lead. I don't see any lead. How's plastic going to protect him from radiation? And so in the beginning, um, we did, I had copious amounts of Vaseline on, on me and Amy Conway, the makeup girl, and Nicole Verhoeven would coat him in Vaseline. But I don't think it read as well as it should on, on the camera. So I tried to make the sheets look sticky. But we have this um, concept of this uh, makeup called, well, KVAS, which is essentially Vaseline or potassium Vaseline. So it was a very transparent coating that looked gluggy, which you put on your body, and that would... Uh, explain why he could sleep overnight in this hot environment but not die of radiation sickness because he was you know, protect, protected by KVAS. And and so constantly, this is what I loved about the science, or was a bit of a burden, was trying to reconcile how does the science work in this world? How do, how, well, how does that happen? You know, how, how does, how does uh, the guy at the end of Shawshank Redemption stick the poster, you know, how does he blue tack it to the wall to the tunnel that he climbs out of. How does he tape the corners if he's already in the tunnel? Little bits of logic like that, that sometimes you can explain most of it occasionally. There's just like a, a hole in the movie and you go, oh, well, hopefully no one notices. And then someone makes a YouTube uh, video on it. <laughs> Let's keep going. It's gonna take a while because we're going through. Okay, so probably won't get past this point uh, but I'll do a, an additional session so um, this is a font from a font package I got online I, I really like it because it's kind of like that Cold War communist block um, font it gives you the vibe dead industrial decay going on there post Chernobyl and then I, um, in the Alien video game, they were talking about you know, all the defects, which I do constantly. And this building the defects into um, the the video and the anything. It, the, you, the, the point is that you can't rely on technology; it's all breaking down. And so you've got this sense of oh, well, um, being surveillance because in the end of the film, there's this idea that there's constant surveillance going on to this world. It could be a simulation, like Elon Musk says. Um, and so people are watching the characters or this sense that they're being watched, but they're not being watched with uh, the best of technology. It's all kind of falling apart. And so that was the idea of the grid lines and the bad TV reception, which is one of my favorite plugins in uh, Final Cut Pro 10. Um, and the slow zoom in, uh, a lot of people said that's reminiscent of John Carpenter. A lot of people said, oh, this is kind of like what John Carpenter does. But no, I never really have related that well to John Carpenter, except for, sorry, I'll retract that, only, only film of his, like I love Snake Plissken, I love Escape from LA in New York, but The Thing, his, his, which was a failure bo at the box office, is an amazing film, and I put up there with um, Alien as like its little brother. The Thing is incredible with Kirk, uh, Douglas Kurt Russell sorry Kurt Russell and then recently remade with Joel Edgerton uh, as a prequel what four or five years ago don't know if it did that much Joel Edgerton by the way uh, I don't know Joel at all but I uh, might have met him in passing he studied the same place I did at the theatre in, in, in Western Sydney he was about even though I'm older than him he was two or three four years in front of me so uh, yeah you've got this idea of what this is going to be um, industrial decay as I said and the music's really interesting because I was really <laughs> looked at a lot of and listened to a lot of Moog I love the sound of the Moog it's just otherworldly and, and theremin devices and that kind of manipulating 
um, sound waves and electronic waves. Uh, it's just an incredible way. And the, the depth of those sounds, the big sounds, and it also kind of echoes back to those Chris Foss um, artworks, of just big analog science fiction. I love the Asimovs. Um, it, I really think that it creates that schism and that sense of, I don't know, wonder and um, tangi tangible, visceral feeling, which a lot of the 3D doesn't do this day, these days, but all these old well, devices, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Keith Emerson's huge Moog synthesizer, you know, I th really thought that that stuff, um, big fat kind of bassy sounds and discordant uh, descending um, waves of sound, really what Painted State was all about. It's, it's, it's kind of like the danger, the danger of it all. It's what it, it, monumental danger. Like the, um, and I'm so leak me around here, but if you look at Charlton Heston and the Statue of Liberty in the last um, scene of Planet of the Apes, I thought that was an amazing scene because it was so dangerous and disturbing. And I don't, even though it's seventies, I don't think that particular shot has um, dated. I think it's still as amazing as it, as it used to be. So that's what I was trying to get here: big sense of blockiness and. Um, imbue that in the audience and as part of that obviously the sound in unison with the images and so I started researching and then I started watching Stranger Things and the thing about apart from it being an amazing series was the actual um, soundtrack and I thought that music at the beginning and then I researched that and how they you know looked at certain fonts and those old horror novel fonts they wanted to get and then the way they shot and built the defects into um, th that sort of uh, the font and they were shining light through it and I think they filmed it and they really were specific about what they wanted um, and it, as much as I talk about stream of consciousness this specific being specific about the, your ideas of creativity are, are what are, what are really important having a very specific idea about what you're going to do and so I thought yes I want this Moog sound I, I want it to sound like the Stranger Things um, there's something about you know, that was almost Tron-esque as well, the, the soundtrack to Stranger Things. And there's some fantastic remixes out there. If I remember, I'll link them as well. Um, so then I went from that and I went to SoundCloud and I started looking at uh, Darkwave um, synthesizer, you know, retro synthesizer music. And then I, one guy made uh, a soundtrack list of about 90 tracks and I started going through those and listening. And then one came on and I thought, oh my God, that music's amazing. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, this would marry so well with Painted State or maybe this opening scene of him getting up. There's something big and grand about it. And then I realized that um, purely, just audibly, I, I detected that it was the same uh, publisher, same composers as the composers of the Stranger Things soundtrack. <laughs> so that's what this music is. It's the same guys called Survive. I think they're out of Atlanta or something like that. Um, and so I got one of their songs and the end of the song, I, I, I acquired the end of that and then I've put it on this video and then YouTube sends you things as well. Don't worry, but you can't monetize this and that's fine. Um, as long as I can use their sounds, not get in trouble to uh, enhance and caress this uh, our concept, great. So that's what I'm using um, for parts of this as well. I mean, the other huge artist that's been, that I've wanted to use but really haven't used as much is Lana Del Rey. And, and when I was thinking about this constantly, um, I'd be jogging down there at Bondi Beach, jogging on the sand and I have Lana Del Rey. I'd have her playing all the time and have a few tracks uh, of hers that I, I would want to use. So that's the music you're hearing at the beginning here. So I'm going to pause it there and we're going to take a break. Okay, so think of this as uh, part one of Blaze Hackman's Masterclass number one. Let's just have a little break.